Have you ever wondered how, from those tall, rugged sugarcane stalks swaying under the blazing sun, people are able to create shimmering white crystals as pure and clear as glass? Refined sugar is not just a familiar ingredient in every kitchen. It is the result of an extraordinary transformation where science, patience, and nature come together in perfect harmony to create something truly remarkable. Every year, millions of tons of sugar are produced from endless fields of sugar cane across the world, feeding billions of meals and bringing sweetness to every corner of life. In this video, we'll witness every step of that fascinating journey, from fresh sugar cane to golden syrup, from the roaring boilers to crystallization, and finally, to the birth of those sparkling grains of sugar. Sugar cane originates from tropical regions, and sugar, its most famous derivative, has been known to humankind for centuries. According to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, FAO, more than 1.9 billion tons of sugar cane are harvested every year across the globe. From this seemingly simple raw material, humanity has built an enormous industry, producing over 180 million tons of sugar annually to satisfy global demand. Today, sugar is far more than just a sweetener used in food production. It plays a crucial role in shaping texture, color, and flavor, and acts as a natural preservative by reducing the water activity in food. Biologically, sugar can be rapidly converted into glucose, the primary source of energy for cells, especially for the brain and muscular activity. But how exactly does raw sugar cane transform into refined, sparkling sugar crystals? And what happens to the fibrous cane residue once its juice has been extracted? The journey of sugar cane begins in vast fields, where heavy tractors plow deep into the soil, loosening it for planting. Specialized machines then carve furrows, apply fertilizer, place seed cuttings about 10 to 12 inches long, and cover them with soil in one seamless motion. From there, farmers spend months tending each row under the blazing sun. In major producing countries like Brazil, Thailand, and Mexico, large-scale irrigation systems keep the soil moist year-round, while constant weeding and regular fertilization ensure strong growth. A single hectare of sugarcane can absorb up to 660 pounds of nitrogen, 330 pounds of potassium, and 220 pounds of phosphorus during its cycle. Thanks to this precise care, the fields grow tall and vibrant, ready for harvest. When the sugar concentration within each joint of the cane reaches its peak, farmers enter the moment they've been waiting for, the harvest. This golden window typically arrives between 10 and 18 months after planting, when the sucrose level inside the stalks is at its highest. In the past, many regions practiced pre-harvest burning, setting dry leaves on fire to clear the fields and drive away snakes or rodents. But as awareness of air pollution and soil degradation grew, this method was gradually abandoned. Today, mechanized harvesters dominate modern sugarcane fields. These colossal machines cut the stalks at the base, chop them into 10 to 12 inch segments, strip away leaves, and neatly pile the clean canes, all in one continuous motion. A single harvester can process over 220,000 pounds of sugarcane per day, dramatically increasing efficiency while reducing manual labor. Yet in smaller farms and traditional regions, hand harvesting still endures. Farmers wield sharp machetes to cut each stalk by hand, a time-honored image that connects the sweetness of sugar to centuries of human labor and resilience. Immediately after being cut, sugar cane must be transported to the mill as quickly as possible, ideally within 12 to 16 hours. Any delay means the sugar inside the stalks begins to deteriorate consumed by natural respiration and microorganisms. Once harvested, the canes are loaded onto trucks, trains, or even barges, depending on the terrain and distance. In Brazil, one of the world's largest sugar producers, long freight trains loaded with freshly cut cane travel endlessly from plantations to massive mills throughout the harvest season. Meanwhile, in Thailand, thousands of small trucks crowd the highways, forming a vibrant, almost festive scene. 
a signal that a new sugar-making season has begun. When the harvested cane arrives at the mill, it carries with it dust, sand, small stones, and bits of plant residue clinging to the outer surface. If not removed beforehand, these impurities can wear down cutting blades and crushing rollers, or mix into the juice, affecting sugar quality and complicating later filtration. As the cane moves along the conveyor belt, high-pressure water jets wash away soil and grit. Larger debris, such as stones or small branches, is separated by vibrating screens or metal grates. In many modern factories, rotating drum washers and vortex cleaning tanks equipped with continuous water sprays are used to ensure the cane is thoroughly cleaned before processing begins. From the washing conveyor, the freshly cleaned sugarcane stalks move toward the crushing and extraction section, where massive steel rollers begin the journey of drawing out the very first stream of sweet juice. The goal of the crushing process is to break down the internal cell structure of the cane, allowing the sugary liquid inside to be released more easily during pressing. Powerful shredding machines tear the stalks apart, rip the fibers, and increase the surface area, reducing the cane into smaller, workable fragments. Pressing then becomes the key stage, the moment when the dissolved sugar is separated from the fibrous matrix of the plant. The extracted cane juice is collected for further refinement, while the remaining bagasse becomes the primary byproduct of the mill. The shredded cane passes through a series of heavy steel rollers designed to squeeze out every last drop of juice. After pressing, what remains is a damp, fibrous residue with very little sugar left. A material that, once dried or processed further, can be used as a fuel source or raw material for other industries. The juice extracted from the crushed sugarcane appears greenish-brown, filled with both dissolved and suspended impurities. Proteins, waxes, organic acids, fine cane fibers, and traces of sand. To prevent that, lime is added to adjust the alkalinity of the juice. The calcium reacts with unwanted compounds, forming insoluble hydroxides and carbonates that can be separated later. Before lime is introduced, a small amount of organic acid often citric or lemon juice, may be added to fine-tune the pH and prevent excess scaling. The mixture is then thoroughly stirred, ensuring complete chemical balance, before being sent into massive settling tanks. Inside these basins, gravity takes over. Heavier impurities slowly sink to the bottom, forming a dense layer of sediment known as clarifier mud. This sediment isn't wasted, once dried, it becomes a nutrient-rich organic fertilizer used back in the cane fields. Meanwhile, the clarified juice, now bright and translucent, continues its journey toward the evaporators, ready to be transformed into the concentrated syrup that will soon crystallize into sugar. After settling, the clarified cane juice contains about 12 to 15 percent sugar by weight, but to crystallize, it must reach over 60 percent. This happens inside multi-effect evaporators, large heat exchangers where the juice boils under reduced pressure, allowing water to evaporate at lower temperatures while preventing sugar from burning. Steam from one stage heats the next, saving energy. As the water evaporates, the liquid thickens into a dark, viscous syrup, then moves to vacuum pans for crystallization. Under low pressure, Seed crystals are added to help sucrose attach and grow. The process is carefully controlled for temperature, pressure, and agitation to form uniform, pure crystals. The result is massacuate, a mixture of solid sugar and residual syrup, ready for centrifugal separation. When the cane syrup reaches the right concentration, it is transferred to vacuum pans for crystallization. Operating under low pressure lowers the boiling point, allowing sugar to form at gentle temperatures and preventing unwanted caramelization. Tiny seed crystals are added, serving as nuclei for sucrose molecules to attach and grow. Temperature, pressure, and stirring speed are precisely controlled to produce uniform, pure crystals. Once crystallization is complete, the semi-solid mixture, called mass 
moves to industrial centrifuges spinning at thousands of revolutions per minute. The intense centrifugal force separates the dark molasses from the solid sugar crystals. The molasses, rich in aroma and minerals, is sold for making rum, ethanol, or animal feed, while the sugar crystals that remain achieve 97 to 99% purity, though still slightly moist before drying. After leaving the centrifuge, the sugar crystals have already been separated from the molasses, yet they still retain about 1 to 2% moisture. If left untreated, that small amount of water could cause the sugar to clump, discolor, or become a breeding ground for microorganisms. That's why drying becomes a decisive stage in ensuring long-term preservation. In modern factories, damp sugar is fed into fluidized bed dryers or hot air conveyor systems. In the fluidized bed process, a powerful stream of hot air, between 250 and 300 degrees Fahrenheit, suspends the sugar particles, allowing moisture to evaporate rapidly while keeping each crystal perfectly intact. Alternatively, in the hot air conveyor method, sugar travels along a fine mesh belt while dry air flows in the opposite direction, gently removing the remaining humidity. Both temperature and drying time are tightly controlled. If the heat is too high, the sugar begins to caramelize. If too short, the moisture remains above standard. The outcome of this precision is remarkable. A sugar so dry and crisp that its final moisture content falls to just 0.02 to 0.05%, leaving each grain loose, bright, and naturally free-flowing without any need for anti-caking additives. When the crisp, dry sugar crystals are finally ready, the process enters its final stage, packaging and distribution. This is not merely a technical step, but a symbol of commitment to quality before the product reaches consumers around the world. First, every batch undergoes rigorous quality inspection. Samples are collected and analyzed for whiteness, solubility, residual impurities, and moisture content. For edible sugar, additional microbiological tests are conducted to ensure complete food safety. Only after meeting all required standards can the sugar proceed to the automated packaging line. Here, computer-controlled systems handle every detail with precision. Multi-layer paper or polypropylene bags are automatically opened, filled to the exact weight, sealed and labeled with production dates and batch identification codes for traceability. Depending on the intended market, sugar may be packed in small 17.6 ounce to 2.2 pound bags for household use, or industrial sacks weighing 55 to 110 pounds for large-scale customers. Once sealed, the finished packages are transported to climate-controlled warehouses. These facilities must remain dry and well-ventilated, with constant humidity and temperature regulation to prevent clumping or discoloration. In many modern factories, automated storage and retrieval systems ASRS, equipped with robotic lifters and autonomous guided vehicles, AGVs, optimize space and streamline internal logistics, ensuring smooth and efficient handling. From this point, the pure white sugar crystals begin their global journey, making their way to supermarkets, small local shops, and even to confectionery plants, beverage companies, and food manufacturers. It's the final step in a closed loop process where each crystal leaving the factory carries not just sweetness, but the mark of technology, craftsmanship, and pride in human ingenuity. When the pure white sugar crystals are ready to leave the factory, the story does not end there. Alongside the sweet product remains a vast amount of fibrous residue, bagasse. Once considered waste, it has now become a valuable resource giving new life to what was once discarded. The most common and economically efficient use of bagasse is as a biomass fuel. It is burned in boilers to produce steam that drives turbines, generating electricity for the factory itself, and any surplus power is sold to the national grid. Around 25% of the world's bagasse is also recycled into paper. After cleaning, the fibers are pulped, pressed, 
and dried into sheets of paper or cardboard. One ton of bagasse can produce about 330 to 440 pounds of paper, helping save millions of trees every year. Bagasse is also used to make eco-friendly packaging. When mixed with starch and recycled paper pulp, the blend is heat pressed at 320 to 390 degrees Fahrenheit, forming biodegradable cups, lunch boxes, and tableware that decompose naturally within 60 to 90 days. From byproduct to energy and sustainable materials, bagasse has become proof that even factory waste can be reborn as a resource, extending the story of sugar into a cycle of renewal and sustainability. From a humble stalk of sugar cane to brilliant white crystals, this journey reflects the harmony of science, technology, and human effort. Each stage from the fields to the factory reveals the precision behind a sweetness that's anything but simple. If you want to keep exploring the extraordinary world of manufacturing, don't forget to like, subscribe, and turn on notifications to uncover a new story of innovation, transformation, and human ingenuity.